Well, we come uh, to the final plenary uh, session uh, for our conference. Uh, we began uh, by thinking about our missional context, our missionary context here in Australia. We thought yesterday about critical issues for the church, and we couldn't really have an Anglican Future Conference without a session on imagining our Anglican future. And uh, what we're hoping to do here is stimulate a conversation uh, that will start today on this stage and hopefully ripple out across uh, the Anglican Church in Australia and New Zealand as we think about what kind of a future uh, God has for us. Uh, I'd like to in, uh, get you to welcome in just a moment uh, Peter Adam uh, to come and uh, open up this topic of discussion for us. Uh, Peter is a former principal of Ridley College here in Melbourne and uh, currently serves as the Vicar Emeritus of St Jude's Carlton, which is a great church just a little bit north of here. <laughs> and uh, we're very pleased to welcome Peter as he comes uh, to address us on the topic of imagining our Anglican future. Would you please welcome Peter? Well, thank you, Richard. It's a great delight to be with you. And uh, I must say, I've been very, so moved by the conference and by the conversations we've been having, uh, what we've done together in launching uh, FCA, and it's been a, a, an immense joy to be here. So I'd like to thank those who imagined the conference, even if they didn't succeed in imagining our future. <laughs> so, thank you. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, please shape and transform us by your gospel grace and by the power of the scriptures inspired by your Holy Spirit. Please help us to live and to minister for your glory and please enable us to do the good works you prepared for us. By your power, may we work and pray for the conversion of sinners and the maturity of your people. We ask these things in the strong name of Jesus, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. Imagining our Anglican future. Adoniram Judson, who was the famous pioneer missionary in Burma, was once tied up and about to be killed. And the man who was about to kill him said, what do you now think of your future? His reply, which I love, is... The future is as bright as the promises of God. The future is as bright as the promises of God. God warns us in the Bible it's foolish to assume that we know the future or to think that we can control or create the future. Indeed, I was amused to find that the prophet Ezekiel was told to prophesy against those who prophesy out of their own imaginations. We may not have a future. The Lord Jesus may return today. A great plague may decimate the developed world. Orthodox churches may abandon the faith. There may be a worldwide revival of biblical Christianity. We in the West will certainly face persecution in 20 years' time. We in Australia may have to pay rates on church property, which will dramatically shape the, change the shape of our ministry. And certainly, leadership of world Christianity will be found elsewhere than in the West over the next 30 years. We do not know the future. We know that our world is changing at an ever-increasing rate and that living in a global village increases the possibility of radical change on a worldwide scale. There are no places to hide in a global village. Our neighbours are too close, sometimes too close for comfort. And as World War III is even more likely now, so is the universal persecution of Christians, fueled either by paganism or by other religions. We do not know the future. However, we learn from Genesis chapter 1 that we humans, made in God's image, have dependent responsibility for the world. We are absolutely dependent on God, who rules his world in power and love. But we're also responsible to God for this world, 
Both are true. We are dependent and responsible. We know that we cannot know the future or control the future. Yet at the same time, our responsibility to God includes provisional planning for the future. The book of Proverbs warns us to plan wisely, an apt word for Anglicans who are more likely to be trapped by the present than they are to plan for the future. Here's the proverb. Go to the ant, you lazy bones. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief or officer or ruler, she prepares her food in summer and gathers her sustenance in harvest. Yet the book of Proverbs also warns us that we cannot control the future, an apt word for the arrogant. The human mind may devise many plans, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will be established. We must plan and we must trust. We should imagine our future, but hold our imaginings and our planning in open hands, trusting that God will achieve his gospel purposes and that Jesus will indeed build his church. As we think about our future, we have three great needs. The first need is to know that Anglicanism is capable of radical change. What is Anglicanism? Does it have a future? Is it worth investing in its future? When thinking about Anglicanism, our natural tendency, even among the senior members who are present, is to universalise our present experience and assume that what we see has always been the case. Parishes always think what the last vicar did is normative Anglicanism. That is not so. Uh, (laughs) Anglicans more broadly think that what happened in the 20th century is the way we have to be. That is not so. Anglicanism is not unchanging. It is contextual and transitional and always changing. Here are some examples of Anglican change. We might think that dioceses and parishes are the essential structures of Anglicanism. That is not so. The early Celtic church in England was based primarily on monasteries and itinerant evangelists, pastors and teachers, not dioceses or parishes. The monastery was the base for evangelism, education and pastoral care. This changed with the arrival of Augustine of Canterbury in 597 AD. He was sent by Pope Gregory to bring that church into line with Roman customs. And these included the introduction of geographical dioceses and parishes. Yet, even after the diocese and parish system was set up in Europe, by the early 1100s, it was no longer capable of effective evangelism and education. So the preaching orders, such as the Franciscans and Dominicans, were set up not by bishops, but by concerned clergy and lay people. They were, and still are, independent of dioceses, bishops and archbishops in the Roman Catholic Church. So the Roman Church has two distinct forms, the diocese and the religious orders. We Anglicans have two distinct forms, dioceses and voluntary societies. And Anglicanism has been profoundly affected by our own voluntary societies, including many evangelical societies. Our church has in fact been pluriform, diocese on the one hand and voluntary societies on the other. You might think that the Anglican communion is essential to Anglicanism. That is not so. The Anglican communion was an invention of the 19th century and was, at least in part, an ecclesiastical reflection of the British Empire, which has now closed down, I understand. Uh, What matters in Anglicanism is not national churches, nor an international association of churches, but uh, national churches, not the international association. And the Anglican communion itself was not actually the product of the evangelistic energy of the Church of England, but came from the evangelistic activities of voluntary missionary societies, some evangelical, such as the Church Missionary Society, and others more high church, like the university's mission to Central Africa. It was, in fact, these societies which provided effective international sharing of resources, prayer, and fellowship before there was anything called the Anglican Communion. And the initiative to evangelise the inhabitants of India did not come from leaders of the Church of England, 
It came from a concerned group of evangelical clergy and laity, members of the Clapham sect. Similarly, the gospel came to Australia not because the Archbishop of Canterbury thought it was a good idea, but because people like John Newton and Wilberforce thought it was a good idea to do it. You might think that the Archbishop of Canterbury must be the leader of what we call the Anglican Communion, and I'm not making any comment about any particular Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, that is not so. The, the idea is based on the notion of geographical origin. The idea, the false idea, that the Church of England originated in Canterbury, and therefore all Anglicans come from Canterbury. But there is no evidence at all that the geographical origin of the Church of England was Canterbury. And Canterbury was certainly not the powerhouse that created Anglican churches around the world. And in any case, an accidental event of history can never become a proof of necessary truths of revelation. You might think that the creative energy for Anglicanism has come from above, from archbishops and bishops. That is not always the case. And some of the great and effective movements for reform within Anglicanism have been come from below, that is, from ordinary people like you or me, rather than from above. I mean, they're bishops and archbishops rather than God. Uh, <laughs> these movements for reform included Wycliffe and Tyndale, the translation of the Bible into English. The bishops first burnt the first translators and their Bibles. The Reformation was exceptional in being a reformation from below and from above. But it certainly would not have been effective without the costly and sacrificial mo movement from below. Similarly, the evangelical movement, the Oxford movement, the East African revival, and the charismatic renewal have all been fueled from below. Such movements have usually been persecuted by the hierarchy, then grudgingly, grudgingly accepted, and then celebrated. In the history of England, it usually takes about 50 years from a persecuted movement to produce an Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> it's amazing. You can follow it through all the way. And the way you achieve change, as one leader of the Oxford movement said, was if there are bad laws, break them. That's what the evangelicals did. That's what the Oxford movement did. That's what the liberals have done. You just break the rules until the church changes. That's how powerful change is from below. So historically, structures have changed. New structures have been created to enable people to be converted, churches to be planted, and people, groups, and nations to be evangelized. One of the great contributions of the Baptist, William Carey, was that he realised that Baptist churches in England could not evangelise the world without what he called a means. So Carey, later missionary to India, of course, wrote his inquiry into the obligations of Christians to use means for the conversion of the heathen, which led to the founding of the Baptist Missionary Society in 1792 and the founding of many other missionary societies in the following years. A means is an organisation, a voluntary society, people who gather together for a set purpose of ministry or mission. The Methodist Church was a means. The Salvation Army was a means. And EFAC, the Evangelical Fellowship of the Anglican Communion, was a movement from below, set up by John Stott and others to offer support, encouragement and resources to Anglican Evangelicals around the world. And the Fellowship of Confessing Anglicans has been set up more recently to serve Anglicans uh, around the world by providing alternative structures and support for those who hold firmly to biblical and creedal Christianity. Both are voluntary societies or means of the Anglican communion, set up to provide what was lacking in that communion and to correct some unhelpful tendencies in that communion. You might think that it's impossible to have more than one Anglican diocesan structure in one place. That is not so. In Europe, there are two different structures of Anglicanism. Europe is in the Diocese of Europe, which is part of the Church of England. 
And Europe is, also has the convocation of Episcopal churches in Europe, part of the Episcopal Church of the USA. Perhaps this is an instructive model for the future around the world. Perhaps we can learn from Europe and for the, this convenient and happy association between these two separate churches working in the one place and recognizing each other equally as Anglicans. What a useful model to have up your sleeve. <laughs> Anglicanism is more flexible than first appears. You might think that the continuation of Anglicanism is essential. That is not so. I've always valued the modest claims of Anglicanism. We do not claim to be the only church. We do not claim to be the best church. We don't even claim to be a necessary church. Anglicanism as tra transitional has been prominent in Anglican ecclesiology in the 20th century. It is the idea that Anglicanism could one day be absorbed into a larger fellowship. It could, on the one hand, reamalgamate with the Roman Catholics, or on the other hand, join other Protestant churches. This has actually happened in India and Pakistan. There, Anglicans joined with other Protestant churches to form the Church of South India, the Church of North India, and the Church of Pakistan. There are no Anglicans left on the subcontinent. They've all joined with other churches to form a larger church. And these churches are not considered part of the Anglican Communion, not invited to the Lambeth Conference as members. So, on a global scale, all Anglicans in all places could decide to join with other churches to form a new church. Anglicanism, as we know, might cease to exist. One of the troubles of the Anglican Communion, I think, is that it's too English. And here is, I love England, I might say, but anyway, here is English identity described by the English novelist John Fowles. Perhaps all this is getting nearer the heart of Englishness, being happier at being unhappy than doing something constructive about it. <laughs> so good. I love that. You see, he said, we boast of our genius for compromise, which is really a refusal to choose. <laughs> and that in turn contains a large part of cowardice, apathy and selfish laziness. I didn't write that, John Fowles wrote it. Over 30 years ago, I decided to respect people who left the current structures of Anglicanism and to hope they'd respect me if I stayed. And in my study of those who left the Church of England in 1662 and those who stayed, I indicated my respect for those who conformed and those who became non-conformists and recognised how God worked for gospel good among both groups of people. Matthew Newcomb, vicar of Dedham in England, was one who resigned in 1662. In his final sermon before he resigned, he preached these words. It hath been all along a merciful, merciful providence of God that when some of his servants could not satisfy their consciences and come up to the things that have been imposed upon them without injuring their consciences, yet others have had a greater freedom given them that they could yield. And if not so, what would have become of the people of God? There is, in all these things, achieved something that may be a providence of God for good to you to be in it. We need EFAC to continue to support Anglicans, whatever their ecclesiastical connection. And we need the FCA for those Anglicans who need new ecclesiastical structures for fellowship, support and encouragement. Even if you don't need FCA today, you may need it tomorrow. And someone else does need it today. So I praise God for the Great response last night as people crowded forward and eager to sign their decision card. <laughs> Anglicanism has constantly changed its shape and style of ministry. Anglicanism is a mixture of the good gifts of God and rank human sinfulness. God in his mercy has used, is using and will use Anglicanism in any kind of form. God does not need Anglicanism in any form, but God in his mercy may continue to use those called Anglicans 
for his gospel purposes for the world. Anglicanism is still changing, and you and I, friends, are all part of that change. Secondly, we need the Spirit's clarity about God's purpose for his church in the last days. If we're thinking, what will we be? What is our future? We need to be rock-solid sure and obedient to the Spirit of God about what a last day's church should look like. And if we try to imagine our future without asking the Bible what is our future, we're sure to be confused, deceived and destructive. I attended a funeral in one of our Anglican parishes late last year. Somebody had died, as you might have guessed. Uh, the Bible reading was from John 14, a promising start. The reading, however, of the Bible finished halfway through John 14:6. So the first half of the verse was read. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then the reading stopped. The second half was not read. It says, as you'll remember, no one comes to the Father but by me. And when the minister preached the sermon, you knew why the Bible reading had stopped mid-verse. What futile arrogance. What unimaginable arrogance to edit the words of the Lord Jesus to fit our theology. There could not be a greater rank stupidity than that. The detective writer P.D. James, a devoted member of the Church of England, has one of her characters describe Anglicanism in these terms about a girl's school this is. Some of the girls practiced a religion, Anglicanism. It was accepted as a satisfying compromise between reason and myth, justified by the beauty of its liturgy, a celebration of Englishness. But essentially it was the universal religion of liberal humanism, laced with ritual to suit each individual taste. Well, God has a bigger vision for the church than that. As God has given us to Peter to show what life will be like in the last days, so God has shown us from Paul's letters to Timothy and Titus what ordinary churches in the post-apostolic change should be look like. Here is a checklist. Whatever the future of Anglicanism, these must be its primary features. One, we need to believe, teach, implement the gospel in our church and proclaim the gospel to the world. I'm writing these instructions to you so that if I'm delayed, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and bulwark of the truth. Without any doubt, the mystery of our religion is great. He was revealed in flesh, vindicated in his spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, taken up to glory. Or Paul again, as for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. Secondly, we need theological clarity about the content of the gospel from the Bible. Hold to the standard of sound teaching which you had heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit. As James Smart wrote back in 1970, Without the Bible, the remembered Christ becomes the imagined Christ, a Christ shaped by the religiosity and unconscious desires of his worshippers, and I would add, or the fears of his worshippers. Without the Bible, we get Christ wrong, and without the Bible, we get the gospel wrong. Here are wonderful words from Bishop J.C. Ryle. The gospel is, in fact, a most curiously and delicately compounded medicine, and a medicine which is very easily spoiled. You may spoil the gospel by substitution. You only have to withdraw from the eyes of the sinner the grand object which the Bible proposes to faith, Jesus Christ, and substitute another object in its place, the church, the ministry, or whatever, and the mischief is done. You may spoil the gospel by addition. You only have to add to Christ some other objects as equally worthy of honour and the mischief is done. He doesn't say this, but I am adding it. You may spoil the gospel by a subtraction, which is the art of liberal theology. Finally, he says, you may spoil the gospel by disproportion. 
You only have to attach an exaggerated importance to the secondary things of Christianity and diminished importance to the first things and the mischief is done. Yes, we need theological and spiritual chastity to avoid the cruelty of heresy. Next, we, lead, we need godly, stable and able ministers of the gospel who don't engage in abusive behaviour. Appoint elders in every town as I directed you, someone who is blameless, someone who has the firm grasp of the word that is trustworthy in accordance with the teaching, that he may be able both to preach with sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict it. We need an effective team of gospel ministries, ministers around the world, both imported and indigenous. Paul had his team of 80 people working with him across the Mediterranean world. Some travelled with him, some he sent to other places, some stayed home to lead ministry in their local area. We read of some of these in 2 Timothy 4. Uh, Demas, in love with the present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescent has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he's useful in my ministry. Greet Prisca and Aquila. Eubulus sends greetings to you, as do Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers and sisters. To have an effective team, we need effective training for gospel ministry to raise up the next generation of gospel workers. You then, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you've heard from me through many witnesses, entrust to faithful people who'll be able to teach others as well. We need people in ministry who know the gospel from the Bible and are equipped and tra trained by the Bible to do their ministry. So Paul writes of those sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and useful for teaching, for a proof for correction, for training in righteousness, that those in ministry may be proficient, equipped for every good work. We need to know that our greatest problem and limitation is our sin and our sinfulness, as we need to know God our Saviour and his transforming gospel. So from Titus, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope and the revelation of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. He it is who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good works. We need to rebuke and correct error in life or theology. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. Avoid profane chatter. It will lead people into more and more impiety and their talk will spread like gangrene. But in doing that, we need to be able to distinguish between fellow leaders who do call on the Lord out of a pure heart, whom we must correct with gentleness, 2 Timothy 2, and those corrupt church leaders who have the form of godliness but deny its power, of whom Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, have nothing to do with them. And we need to be able and willing to suffer for the gospel. I love Cranmer's ordination services, not least because the instrument or means of ministry is the Bible handed to every candidate. But I'd love to add one question to every ordination service. Not just do you believe the gospel, but are you willing to suffer for the gospel? For a person who's not willing to suffer for the gospel won't go very far in ministry. For all ministry involves suffering, as indeed Paul wrote, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Here in the West, people may not worry about what we believe in private, but object to both our theology and our ethics in public. And our gospel suffering will come from the church and from the world, as Paul knew so well. I think there will be widespread persecution of Christians in the West in the 20th century, in the 20 years' time, rather. We must prepare ourselves, our children, our churches and our converts to stand firm. I'll be dead. Some of you may still be alive. 
Ministers who are not willing to suffer for the gospel will not defend the gospel. And the soft heretics of Anglicanism practice what I call heresy by silence. In themselves, they do believe the gospel, but they're not willing to preach it publicly. They may like the fruits of gospel ministry, but not like gospel ministry. They may like the fruits of gospel ministry, but not know how to do it themselves. But silence about the atoning death of Christ, silence about sin, silence about grace, and silence about repentance and faith, that deafening silence is a deadly silence. We preach Christ crucified, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Without the message of Christ crucified, we only have worldly weakness and worldly foolishness. We should be encouraged by our brothers and sisters facing persecution today. May we learn, we in the West, learn from their endurance. And I've been very challenged recently by this prayer request from the persecuted church in the Middle East. Listen carefully. Don't pray for us, pray with us. If you pray for us, you'll pray for the wrong things. You'll pray for safety. But if you pray with us, you'll ask God to bring millions to faith in Christ. And you will pray that when the inevitable backlash comes because of our witness, we'll be faithful, even if it costs us our lives. What an extraordinary prayer. Where so often when I go to churches, we're praying for the happiness of our missionaries. Toothache. The parrot that escaped and so on. It's okay to pray for us escaped parrots. They are in danger from feral cats and so forth. But there are perhaps more substantial things to pray for for our missionaries, namely that Jesus Christ will be known through their ministry. Well, here are some words of encouragement from the Barman Declaration made by the, the Confessing Church in Germany in 1934 as it protested against liberalism in the church, which caved into the pressures of its society and nation and changed its gospel. They said... If you find that we are speaking contrary to Scripture, then do not listen to us. But if you find that we are taking our stand on Scripture, then let no fear or temptation keep you from treading with us the path of faith and obedience to the Word of God. In order that God's people be of one mind on earth, and we in faith experience what he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And thirdly, third great need, we need absolute trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Saviour, Lord and Judge of his church. If we try to imagine our future without reading the Bible, without trusting in Christ, we're sure to be confused, deceived and destructive. God gave us Paul's letters to Timothy and Titus to teach us what ordinary churches of the post-apostolic age would look like. So he gave us the book of Revelation to increase our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, whatever our future. And Revelation begins, as you know, with this vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. Please see it with me. I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth with a sharp double-edged sword, his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead." Then he placed his right hand me, on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Notice two important features of this vision of Christ. He is seen among the golden lampstands as walking among the golden lampstands. Like the high priest in the Old Testament sanctuary, Christ walks among the golden lampstands and walks among them to tend them, to care for them. In that sanctuary, the golden lampstands 
in the holy place were a reminder of the glory and presence of God. But in this vision, the seven golden lampstands are the seven churches addressed in John's letter. So, Christ walks among the churches. He sees the churches. He knows them. He speaks to them with a specific message for each of those churches. And that message is also what the Spirit says to all the churches. Notice, secondly, the speaking of this message is the important feature of this vision. Come out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. Christ is present among his churches and he speaks these powerful words to them and so to us. And Christ walks among his churches even today. He walks among our churches. He knows our churches better than we know them ourselves. He knows our works. He knows our good works and rewards them. He knows our bad works and he condemns them. And he warns us of our dangers and encourages us in our strengths and invites us to trust his promises. So he says to the church at Ephesus, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people and that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. On the other hand, he warns the church at Thyatira not to tolerate false teaching, idolatry and immorality. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I am he who searches hearts and minds. I'll repay each of you according to your deeds. Even the toleration of evil is condemned. Sardis has a good reputation, but is in deep trouble. I know your deeds. You have the reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. And here are his words to the church in Laodicea, words of warning, words of gracious encouragement. I know your deeds, that you were neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other, but because you were lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. You don't realise you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. We need to know that the Lord Jesus Christ is the glorious and sufficient saviour, redeemer of his church. That he is the glorious and sufficient Lord of his church. And that he is the glorious and sufficient judge of his church. If we do not know this, we might despair. We might give up. We might try to control. We ourselves might try to save the church, to rule the church, to secure the church, or judge the church. But this is Christ's work. He does it even today as he walks among his churches to tend them, correct them, and care for them. He sees, he knows, he saves, he warns, he judges, and he rewards. We do not know what our, what our world will be like over the next 50 or 100 years or until the return of Christ. We don't know the future of world Christianity. But we do know from the book of Revelation that no prayer is wasted because the prayers of the saints rise to the presence of God. We know from this book that no good work is wasted because the Lord Jesus knows our good works, commends them and rewards them. 
We do know that no sin is unknown to Christ or unnoticed or ignored by him. He rebukes our sins and invites and commands us to repent. We do know that no repentance is wasted because we are set free from our sins by the blood of the Lamb who loves us. And we know that no suffering is wasted for the followers of the Lamb will suffer and will conquer by suffering. And we know that no ministry is wasted because the Lord Jesus knows our good works, commends them and rewards them and because he and he alone is worthy of our service. We do not know the future of Christianity in Australia. Will we face virulent persecution? Will we become a flourishing persecuted church? Will we see widespread revival? We don't know. But we do know from the book of Revelation that no personal repentance, self-denial or self-restraint is wasted. For those who wash their robes will eat of the tree of life and enter the city. We know that no self-sacrifice is wasted because when Christ comes, he will bring his rewards with him. We do know that not even our weak ministry is wasted because though we may feel weak, we are in fact the armies of heaven following the lamb, praising the lamb, witnessing to the lamb, conquering through the lamb and one day ruling with him. And we know that no careful tending of the church is wasted because Christ himself walks among the churches, tending them, caring for them and encouraging them. We know that no speaking, teaching or preaching of the Bible is wasted because the Lord Jesus who tends the churches has a voice like the roar of many waters and his words are like a two-edged sword. We know that no martyrdom is wasted because those who conquer will sit with Christ on his throne. That new and no endurance is wasted because those who endure will eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. We do not uh, no sa- service, suffering or sacrifice is wasted because the slain lamb has conquered and is worthy of all power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory and blessing. We do not know the future of Christianity in the two-thirds world. Will those churches lapse into legalism or liberalism? Will they be taken over by syncretism or the prosperity gospel? Will they re-evangelize the West? I hope they do. Will they lead a worldwide revival of biblical Christianity? I pray they will. We do know that Satan's work is to spread heresy and persecution. But we also know that we can conquer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our witness and by not loving our lives even unto death. We do know that no evangelism is wasted because there will be a great multitude that no one can number from every nation, tribe, language and people standing before the throne and before the Lamb crying with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And we know that no cleansing of the church is wasted because one day we will be revealed as the bride, the wife of the Lamb as God's holy city, having the glory of God, radiant as a rare jewel, and the dwelling place of God and the Lamb. And an R.M. Judson has said, the future is as bright as the promises of God. And Paul wrote, all the promises of God find their yes in Christ. My dear brothers and sisters, whatever else you do, Please keep trusting Jesus Christ. It's his world, his church, his salvation. Trust him strongly, intentionally, purposefully, constantly, every moment of every day. Amen. I wonder if members of our panel uh, would come forward, uh, up and sit on the stage here. You know who you are. That'd be good.
Here are members of our panel who are going to uh, just respond to Peter. Uh, on the end, uh, Mike Paget, uh, the rector of St Barnabas Broadway in Sydney. Next to him, Michael Stead. Oh, I put the two Sydney siders together. It just happened that was they have the handheld mic. Uh, Michael Stead is the rector of uh, St James Taramara and uh, the secretary of the General Synod Doctrine Commission and on the General Synod Standing Committee. Ben Underwood on the staff of uh, St Matthew Shenton Park in Perth. Dr Jude Long is the, pr is the principal of Noongalinya College in Darwin, a training college for Indigenous Christians. And uh, Wei Han Kwan, on the end, is the state director uh, for CMS Victoria. And uh, again, they've, they've had a, a preview of this afternoon and they're going to make some comments on uh, their understanding of the imagining our Anglican future. Mike, start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, both Stephen and Peter today, I have so in the last couple of days, mentioned the changing dynamics and structures within the Anglican Church historically. Uh, and I, I'd like to reflect as a parish pastor who cannot reflect on some of the more uh, national level organisations that others can perhaps speak to. Uh, in Sydney, where I come from, we have progressively decentralised our diocese. We've stripped powers from the Archbishop, uh, which is a good thing, and move them to the local church, uh, who've not always used them well, but it is a good intention because the local church is more important than the denomination. Uh, however, to decentralise is not the same thing as pursuing a parochial separatism, which is where I think we've tended to go. Uh, my church, for example, in the inner city has grown uh, over the last uh, eight or so years by about 50% which sounds wonderful until you realise that the city of Sydney since 1991 has gone from 90,000 people to 200,000 people, growing by about 110%, leading to an effective decline of about 30% in our influence in the city, which means that the 25 other churches in the city that have been planted or revitalised in that time are crucial for the growth of the kingdom in our area. Um, there's dramatic shifts in mobility leading to uh, resource intensification in one area, in one resource, and then in another area for a different resource. And therefore, the churches started looking very lumpy, uh, with some churches looking very rich in one way, and just next door, another church looking rich in another way, and both of them sharing a poverty in different things. Uh, what I think, hearing Peter reflect upon the centrality of Christ and of the gospel uh, is that we as churches need to learn what it is to prize the gospel rather than our parochial success, fame or structures. Uh, I long to see congregations hold themselves lightly and hold the parish dearly. Parishes hold themselves lightly and see the city mission as precious and dioceses uh, holding themselves provisionally and seeking the kingdom passionately. And I think what that means is us, well, for those of us who are clergy here, the great challenge is we are assessed, and we are assessed, uh, by our success in playing a part in seeing our parish grow rather than the kingdom flourish. Uh, I think that is tremendously destructive. And so... Uh, as a way forward, if we trust in the gospel particularly, we will trust less in our parish and we'll work out ways uh, to revisit our parochial structures, to hold them loosely and pursue a costly partnership at the local level for the good of our partners in the gospel nearby and therefore for the kingdom. Great. Thank you, Mike. Um, ben, a view from the west. It's a long way away from here. <coughs> Uh, is there anything particularly you want <laughs> in, in terms of a, what you want me to... I could, do you want me to... Just, just okay. Uh, well, I don't know if this is particularly from the west of Australia, but it seems to me that um, the conference has put its finger on what I think are two great challenges facing the Anglican Church in Australia, which is the, the challenge of engaging with our wider society, which has obviously turned its back on... Christian faith and walked away pretty determinedly and that is 
an enormous challenge of how to minister the gospel in that context to those people. And I think that is probably the one that most of us have most on our hearts, I think, and I really would like to see that cause go forward. Um, but there is also the internal challenge, which has been with us a long time as well, of uh, figuring out how to respond to you know, heterodoxy uh, and drift within, within Anglicanism itself. Uh, and I think that we've probably paid a little less attention to a really thoughtful way of approaching the challenges. And so I think this conference has certainly at least got me thinking more about those things than I have before. And uh, not least because I knew I had to get up here and say something at the end. But, but um, I do think we probably have a job to do in thinking through uh, really thoroughly in a principled way together as much as we can about how will we meet those challenges? I mean, obviously this has to be done anew in every generation because these challenges have been with us a long time. But I think we need to, we need to think about how do individual congregations relate to one another, how do individual ministers relate to one another, how does that all connect to our Anglican structures of Episcopal oversight? What are the ways that we can contend for the faith effectively? What... What are the principles we should bring to that? What are the steps we can take in a graded way to protest, to contend, yeah. uh, to be gadfulized, whatever we need to do? I, I think we need to think and talk a lot more about that. This has been a good yeah. start. Yeah. Thank you. In our, our seminar today, we were talking about, uh, from the S FCA's perspective, about all, the, all of those challenges of like, how do, we, how do we actually kind of start to do this contending and, and do it in a constructive way? Uh, Jude, you're in a very different context to many of the people <laughs> sitting in this room, mm. uh, working with uh, Indigenous leaders in the Northern Territory. Particular perspective? Yes, well, I think I wanted to firstly say I was very encouraged by Peter's talk and the reminder that the Anglican Church has changed yes. and can change and that it should be transitional and be adapted to local need and community. And uh, I do come from a very different context and um, I think the thing that I've really been concerned about is how little there's been discussion about the First Peoples of Australia in this context. Yeah. Um, uh, Mark mentioned it yesterday. There was a beautiful story in Kanisha's Bible study this morning. I'm like, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, and I confess that before I went to Noongalinga, I wouldn't even have noticed. But for me, it has been like a constant little smack in the face an almost expression of terra nullius that has been present. And I think that as you look to the future, you bring the past with you. And we're all complicit in a terrible corporate sin against Indigenous people. And without recognition, repentance, reparation and change, that sin will continue to pollute us as we move to the future. You can't walk freely into the future with the mud of the past stuck to your feet. And um, I'd like us to be thinking about how can we listen to our First Peoples to allow the flavour and the content and the shape of Anglicanism to be changed by the unique context of Australia. Julianne talked about working with young people and taking little steps there's lots of little steps we could take. You know, could we just sing some in Indigenous songs in language uh, in our churches? That's a little step. That would make a huge difference. Um, this is a story. I, I, we sang a song at our church recently, and we're in Darwin. We don't normally do it. And there was an Indigenous lady, and she embraced me for singing a song in her language. And related to this is the distribution of resources Paul took up, a suffering, uh, took up a collection for those suffering in Jerusalem. Um, the early church was clearly demonstrating the love of Christ by caring for each other. And those of you down south would find it really hard to imagine the challenges of ministry in the Northern Territory. We have lots of Indigenous clergy, 
but none of them are paid. We have a theological college that we can't fit the students in because we don't have enough resources or teachers. We have people who long to read the Bible but can't because it's not in their own language. We have communities that not only don't have internet access, but when we're trying to get our students to come to college, we ring the public phone and hope a child doesn't answer it and leave it hanging off the hook. I think I could go on and on, but you get my point. As we look to an Anglican future, can it please be one where we seek to address injustice and care for the poor and the marginalised, where those who are hungry for the word of God can be fed, where the last can be first and the first last? And perhaps if our church looked a bit more like that, maybe we wouldn't have some of those other issues that we're facing. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, I knew that was going to be a good decision asking you to come up here. Uh, Michael, just moving back uh, to Sydney for a moment, down the other end. I wonder if you want to uh, just give a reflection. Yeah. Um, I'm really thankful to Peter, uh, having the opportunity to read his uh, speech in advance. It's had me thinking over the last week or so uh, and excited about the future. Uh, I have to confess I'm a glass half full kind of guy and so I am by nature naturally optimistic. Uh, but I was thinking back to the kind of general tone of despair and gloom over the Anglican Church at General Synod last year because of the viability report, uh, which paints a pretty grim picture. Uh, it, I, I was stimulated to think about all the opportunities and I guess I'm seeing all the exciting possibilities in the future. Uh, I'm excited about uh, what's been happening with GAFCON and uh, to, with um, Australian, uh, the, the, see, the FCA Australia uh, here, uh, the fact of this conference. Uh, but it's more than that. It's actually the excitement of, of seeing the Lord of the church at work in his church. And I think that we are in one of those moments in history. Um, I'm excited about the possibility of what lies before us. But I also, it's a muted uh, optimism because I can see three, at least three ways in which we could stuff it up really badly. And so uh, as I look to the future, there's excitement tinge with the, oh, could we could we derail what the Lord is doing? Um, and, and the three areas that I, I fear, um, one has to do with the way that we engage uh, with uh, those who are not us and um, particularly in the way that, as, as it seems to me, uh, biblically orthodox Christianity is in the ascendancy in, in our country. The growing uh, Anglican churches are those who, who honour the Lord Jesus and his word uh, and those who, who do not, who have misplaced or displaced that, uh, are in decline and they are feeling threatened and suspicious of us at the moment and we must continue to contend uh, for the truth of the gospel. We need to do it in a way uh, that is winsome and persuasive and that the only offence that we cause is the offence of the gospel and that we contend without being contentious. And I, my, So my fear is here's a great opportunity for the, the expansion of um, biblically orthodox Christianity across the Anglican Church in Australia, provided we do it right and not do it smugly, arrogantly and with a triumphalist tone. Um, my... Uh, my second uh, reason for muted optimism is my, my reading of our Anglican and Evangelical heritage is that we are really good at splitting off from each other, particularly when things are going okay. And um, my grandmother taught me a little um, song when I was a child, Jesus bids us shine with a pure, clear light. It ends with the line, you in your small corner and, my in my, and I in mine. And I think we've kind of made that a theological dictum, um, almost like an Elijah complex, uh, I, only I, Lord, uh, as though we, we alone are the ones who hold the... And so we, we, we tend to fight against, we spend as much time contending for the gospel as contending against each other. And so I'm excited about what I see with, uh, with FCA and GAFCON, the fact that we can embrace people around a common biblical understanding, respecting that there are differences amongst us. I was really encouraged to hear about what was happening, no, sorry, not encouraged, I'm devastated to hear what's happening in New Zealand with Motion 30, but I was excited to see those three different possibilities uh, and, and people still in fellowship, even though they've taken very different decisions for reasons of genuine conscience, but they can still agree as brothers and sisters so excited but but worried that we could we could easily so go back into our little corners uh, and then thirdly and my biggest reason for muted optimism is that I fear that it's easier to fight against 
um, the Liberals and it's easier to contend with those of us who aren't quite like us and forget that the far biggest challenge is to contend with a, a world that has left the gospel behind and if we could spend half as much energy engaging with a world that is disengaged with God and stop spending so much time fighting each other, I, I really think God could do even more with us than he's doing at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Wei Han, you're a relatively new state director of CMS Victoria. Been there a year and two years, something like that. Uh, got some comments on the future of that? Sure. Uh, thank you, Richard. I'm not only a new, relatively new state director, I'm also a relatively new Anglican, having come through. Uh, Malaysia and Singapore and the Presbyterian Church and the Methodist Church. I didn't know that. Uh, so I've, oh, thank you, Michael. <laughs> so I come, like, I think, as a bit of a grateful latecomer and uh, growing up in the Methodist Church, I thought the Wesleys wrote the prayer of humble access. So uh, I'm grateful to have been corrected by Ashley uh, these few days. Uh, I guess as I imagine the Anglican future, uh, I imagine it from that standpoint as a relatively, uh, well, as a very grateful but relative latecomer, and I'm trying to filter it through what it, mean, what it would mean for me to be a good steward of all of God's goodness to me through the Anglican Church uh, and through most of you who've got uh, much more standing in the Anglican Church than I have. Uh, one of my observations uh, through uh, Christian life and uh, study is that all movements tend over time to institutionalize. So uh, it doesn't really matter what movement you're part of. Uh, the question you need to be asking longer term is, what sort of institution am I becoming part of or do I want to leave behind? Uh, what form of institutional life? Uh, is the question, not whether you will have one or you won't have one. And, and to me, I think as I, I survey mission movements uh, around the world, that's, that's one of the great weaknesses of uh, nascent mission movements, that they, they think they don't need institutions when, in fact, if the Lord blesses them with success, they will institutionalize over time. Uh, so just before coming to CMS, uh, I had the privilege of spending a couple of years in study with Peter trying to keep me on track here, my brother. Uh, and the fruit of the study is on the screen behind us, uh, I see. Now, apologies to those of you in EFAC who've seen this before. Uh, but I became interested in the question of, as we look to the future, what, what makes for long-term evangelical continuity? And by long-term, I don't mean uh, two or three generations. I mean five, six, seven generations. How do you grow uh, something which is not gospel-centered into something that's robustly gospel-centered and Christ-proclaiming and Bible-using uh, over a hundred-year period. And uh, the answer is on the screen before you, uh, I think, <laughs> humbly, submit to you. Um, you need, uh, firstly, healthy evangelical parishes, because parishes are where, as Michael's reminded us, we have opportunities to do evangelism from cradle to grave. Anyone who lives within your boundaries of whatever language group ought to be a legitimate target of evangelistic activity. Uh, so from parishes then, parishes are hard work. I used to work in a parish, and uh, the problem with Sundays is every Sunday is six days after the first one or this one. And so much energy goes into every Sunday. So it, I think my reading of history is that too much of our Anglican energy goes into our beautiful liturgy or creating something every Sunday, and consequently we lose the amount of available energy for co-face evangelism, creative evangelism, throwing, 90, uh, throwing 100 things at a wall evangelistically for the sake of the one thing that will stick. Uh, and that's the task of the evangelical societies, which is the S. Yes. Uh, and evangelical societies have tended to be the places where the most evangelistically energetic and creative in our parishes tend to flock for their common purpose. It might be AFES because they want to work on campuses, or CMS because they want to work overseas, or Scripture Union, or Crusaders, and the list could go on. Uh, the societies are the place where Anglicans and Christians of every denomination focus their evangelistic energy and try stuff. And for the sake of the one thing that works, we ought to keep pouring energy into our societies, all of them. From the societies then, the most energized, the most inspired from them uh, will want to go to a, a healthy theological college 
uh, the finishing school that they go to to pass through to full-time gospel ministry. Uh, and in, in my thinking, from the colleges, the last piece of the puzzle is a merely friendly bishop. <laughs> Just friendly will do. Uh, a friendly bishop who will be happy to ordain and license said graduates of the college back into the parishes. And if you can get all four in the same place over a period of time, uh, you end up with a diocese of Sydney post uh, Howard Mole. If you don't, you might have the most illustrious uh, beginnings, such as in the Diocese of Melbourne with Charles Perry, the uh, flag-waving vice president of CMS and uh, avid evangelical, but still end up in the space that Melbourne is in uh, today. So I want to leave you with two quotes, uh, because as I imagine the Anglican future, I'm really wanting to imagine a long-term future where dioceses everywhere all around the world have, will have these four boxes ticked. And I think the Australian church has such a huge role in supporting each of those four boxes in different contexts all around the world. There are places where the colleges are weak, or there are places where there's no uh, society movement, or there are places where bishops need to be supported. I'll leave you with two quotes. The first quote is from uh, my great hero, Charles Perry, whom at the founding of the Australian Board for Mission in 1851 said, uh, I believe there's nothing better calculated to increase the health of the local church than a vital commitment to world mission. You see, when we send our best, God knows how to bless us in return. Nothing better calculated to increase the health of our local churches than a firm commitment to world mission. Uh, and the second quote I want to leave you uh, is from a one-time Archbishop of Sydney, I think. You might remember saying this to me once upon a time. He said, uh, there's nothing more frightening to an Archbishop of Sydney than the sight of a well-informed laywoman entering his office. <laughs> remember that? Yeah. He looks white, white-faced, even at the thought. And that's really a plea that none of this gets achieved without uh, a very, very strong laity. Uh, clergy are underpaid and overwork. Uh, lay, pe lay people are our greatest support and uh, the greatest strength. And uh, part of my fear coming to Anglican conferences is that they're, they're overly clerical. Uh, and I, I want to be frightened by a few strong lay women. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Would you thank like me you. to make a face? Would you thank uh, <laughs> You frightening play women out there. If you... <laughs> uh, well, uh, this is the first time I've run this conference and uh, I just realised uh, that we should have left uh, twice the amount of time for this session. I uh, had wanted to have a conversation between these folks, but time has defeated us. So uh, would you please thank the panel? I'm going to ask the band not to play. We just drop this song. Sorry. I've, I've just told the band we're dropping this song. Can you... You can go now. <laughs> you got your applause. Thank you very much. And thank you to Peter for uh, a great uh, address to us. Uh, Stephen. Stephen and I uh, would like to uh, thank some people who have uh, served us so well. So uh, first off, we want to thank Ashley Null. Uh, where is Ashley? Is he still amongst us? Up there. Do come down. Uh, let's uh, give, express our appreciation to Ashley. <laughs> I'd never heard Ashley speak before at the, this conference, and uh, I didn't. When, when Richard suggested, I wasn't convinced that we needed to be convinced about the three things he spoke about because about, in the main we are. But he's given us a whole fresh and delightful perspective on all of those and I think that's been very rich. Thank you. Keep going. Uh, Kanishka Raffel. Is Kanishka still here? Do come down. So Kanishka has uh, led us in preaching and teaching from God's Word, done that with uh, his usual uh, style and quality. But as well as that, uh, with great passion and conviction, I think uh, each of the three sessions uh, were outstanding. So thank you so much, Kanishka, for your care and attention.
Richard's going to do the next section because it involves the sponsors and he's very good at talking about the sponsors. Great. Uh, we've had three platinum sponsors who have uh, supported us this week. Uh, Ridley College, Moore Theological College and Compassion. Uh, we love our two... Uh, uh, Evangelical Anglican Colleges, uh, and uh, we're very uh, thankful for their ministry uh, to us and their support of the conference uh, and uh, the terrific work of Compassion, uh, who are really changing lives around the world. We want to thank them. Uh, the Anglican Church League for our reception last night. Uh, the two aid ag agencies who have uh, supported us, Anglican Aid and the Anglican Relief and Development Fund Australia. The Bush Church Aid Society enabled us uh, to offer rural tickets uh, to uh, people uh, from around the country and uh, even overseas to come and join us. Anglican Deaconess Ministries made a number of bursaries available for women uh, to attend this conference. And uh, we've also been very ably supported uh, by Signal Audio, who are the people who have looked after all of our audio and audio visual. Uh, uh, and... Uh, and all the videos that you'll be able to uh, access online. Uh, can I just put in a plug for them? Uh, they are a very professional company run by Christians and they would go anywhere in Australia to help you install a new sound system in your church and uh, they are excellent uh, people at doing that and will run uh, events like this for you. So please go and talk to them if you are in the market uh, for that. Thank you uh, to our sponsors. It's been really great to have you. Stephen. Thank you. And uh, we've had uh, bands from St Jude's in Carlton as well as St Hilary's uh, Network. So thank you very much for your participation and contribution. That's been fantastic. Uh, we've been well served by our uh, plenary speakers. Uh, Tracy Lawson bringing together the panel on uh, Wednesday. Stephen Howe bringing the panel together yesterday. And uh, Peter Adam uh, bringing the panel uh, together today uh, and we have gifts for all of them but because of time we're not going to uh, present them in front of you. Uh, our workshop leaders who are too numerous to mention, uh, we want to thank uh, all of them. So would you do that please? We've been very honoured uh, this week to have uh, special guests uh, and uh, we're very pleased uh, that we've had Archbishop Eliud and uh, Mama Rhoda with us and Archbishop Stanley and Mama Beatrice. Uh, we want to thank you, Archbishop Eliud, for uh, making the long journey and uh, having to head back so quickly. Uh, we're, we're very thankful uh, that you have been with us. Would you please thank Archbishop Eliud and Archbishop Stanley. Thank you. And uh, you can hear Archbishop Eliad preach at St Hilary's on Sunday if you want to come along at 10 o'clock. We're meeting at the Presbyterian Ladies' College for a big crowd, so that should be exciting. And finally, but last but not least, we want to acknowledge the incredible work done by Tracy Larson as the director of the Peter Corney Training Centre. Uh, and we have a small gift here to express our appreciation. Tracy has worked tirelessly for months. Uh, and as I always say, Tracy is the consummate professional and uh, we're very fortunate to have her at our church, but as well as that, uh, to be running this conference. And last but not least, we should thank this man here because he has done most of the work. Uh, for some reason, his name is not on your list. Uh, but uh, <laughs> this conference has been kind of unique because you may not know, but there were two... Uh, we, got, we were thinking of a national EFAC conference, which we haven't had for quite a long time. Uh, FCA were apparently were thinking about a national conference. It seemed kind of crazy for two separate conferences to happen at a similar time, so we decided to work together. Uh, we have had a conference committee which has never met. So it's quite a unique way of organising a conference. I'd recommend it. It's very neat and tidy. Um, <laughs> saves a lot of stress, but uh, Richard has done the bulk of the organising and uh, his fingerprints are on virtually everything uh, and uh, he's done a brilliant job, so let's acknowledge and express the, our appreciation there. Thank you. And I gather through a misunderstanding we have another set of flowers somewhere. Yes. Uh, Therefore, we, your wife. Well, no. Were, were we? Well, you've already resolved that problem. See, there you are. <laughs> you, want, you, you wanted to thank Tracy, <laughs> and I wanted to thank Tracy, but That's we right. didn't talk to each other, and so we both bought her flowers. So she's got two bunches <laughs> of flowers to take home. Anyway. Yours are bigger than mine. Okay, all right. Yeah. That's good. Are we done? Do you want to make any closing comments? Um, well, anyway, thank you for coming. I think it's been a 
fantastic event. We've had uh, great representation from right across Australia. And as I said at the outset, uh, we're a far-flung country. Uh, New Zealand, we've never had people from New Zealand come in large numbers before. So I think that's been very rich and special for us. Yes. So let's acknowledge that. And uh, I always feel like it's fantastic to get together across the country because isn't, there isn't much that does bring us together. Uh, and we do hold a lot in common. Uh, and uh, we have many bonds of fellowship and friendship and connections which need to continue to be nurtured. And we're all enriched and we all benefit from that. So uh, hopefully this will be an encouragement to you and we'll see a continued upturn in gospel ministry as a result of this conference as well as uh, the strengthening of those bonds and that support. Thank you, Stephen. Richard. Uh, those uh, who are on the bus, uh, your bus is going to leave oh. uh, from Hungry Jacks uh, at uh, 3.15, uh, which is just on Lonsdale Street, uh, so you've got time to get there. Uh, in just a moment, Tracy's going to come and lead us uh, in prayer. We're going to sing one last song uh, to finish our conference together. So, Tracy, would you come and lead us as we pray ourselves uh, out of this conference? Well, friends, we've been moved to a renewed love of God's church and God's word and God's world and to our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and also to a renewed appreciation and joy in using our Anglican prayer book and to Thomas Cramner's work. Uh, we go back to our parishes shortly. Uh, we've been encouraged to move to get our skates on and respond to our changing missionary context and uh, to the challenges facing us as a church. Um, I'm encouraged by that verse in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24, which says, The one who calls us is faithful, and he will do it. We don't work on our own. He works through us. Uh, we're going to have a litany that comes up on the screen. Let's stand and encourage each other as we go back to our ministries. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits. We affirm our love of the gospel as God's glorious good news in Christ for every dimension of his creation, for it has all been ravaged by sin and evil. We love God as God first loved us. We affirm our love for the church as God's people, redeemed by Christ from every nation on earth and every age of history, to share God's mission in this age and to glorify him forever in this age to come. We love because God first loved us. We affirm our commitment to worshipping and serving God in and through the Anglican Church. We commit ourselves to be faithful to the scriptures, to work with our brothers and sisters within the Anglican Church and to play our part in its mission in Australia, New Zealand and beyond. We love because God first loved us. We affirm our love for God's world, so far from God, but so close to his heart, the world that God so loved that he gave his only son for its salvation. We love because God first loved us. God commands us to make known to all nations the truth of God's revelation and the gospel of God's saving grace through Jesus Christ, calling all people to repentance, faith, baptism and obedient discipleship. May God our Father give us grace to fulfill this our mission in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. God commands us to reflect his own character through compassionate care for the needy and to demonstrate the values and the power of the kingdom of God in striving for justice and peace in caring for God's creation. May God our Father give us grace to fulfill this our mission in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In response to God's boundless love for us in Christ and out of our overflowing love for him, we rededicate ourselves with the help of the Holy Spirit to fully obey all that God commands with self-denying humility, with joy and courage. We renew this commitment with the Lord in love because he first loved us. We go forth to love the Lord our God with our, heart, with our whole heart and with our soul and our mind and all our strength. In the name of Christ, amen. We go forth to love our neighbour, including the foreigner and any enemy, as ourselves. In the name of Christ, amen. 
We go forth to love one another as God in Christ has loved us. In the name of Christ, amen. We go forth to love the world with the love of God, God who was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. In the name of Christ, amen. O church, arise.